in Luke. Gospel of Luke chapter 12 will be in the beginning of that chapter together this morning. We're all afraid of that moment uh, when, when we're put on the spot. Uh, maybe this happened to you. you. You didn't really prepare all that well for class. You didn't prepare the way you knew you should. And so that class, you're, you're slunk down in your chair, avoiding eye contact with the teacher. But she calls on you to be the first one to give your speech uh, suddenly your, your body is like a Navy submarine that has come under attack. Like, everything's scrambling to battle stations, heart pumping, hands shaking, palms sweaty, and you stumble to the front of the room. Everybody's looking at you, and they're already snickering because, well, they're not up there. You are, and they're getting ready to let you know about all the ways you've messed up. And the teacher, she's serious because she is actually grading you. Have you ever been put on the spot when it comes to your faith? Many of us have had that moment where somebody says, kind of out of the blue, so, so you're a Christian. Oh, I'm like, whoa, 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 battle stations, they're asking me the question, what do I, how do I answer? Scrambling, scrambling. Many other believers we know, we know that many before us, down through history and around the world, have, have had to literally stand before some kind of judgment. Are you a Christian? When the answer could mean prison or beatings or death. And sometimes we wonder, how could they do that? How could they face that moment with courage? Face that moment with even peace? How were they ready for that moment? Jesus gives us some of the answers in our text this morning, Luke chapter 12, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 12. I'd love for you to follow along. In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he, Jesus, began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. This is God's Word. As I put it on the back of the worship folder and the outline that's there, sooner or later, you will be judged for your faith in Christ, but will you stand when it really counts? That's a question that we may feel some urgency of today, even if we've never had to stand before a court or a firing squad. Here's the way we're breaking this down this morning. The first section, first part of the passage, and the first part of the sermon. Beware of hypocrisy, because everything that is hidden now 
will be exposed one day. Two weeks ago, uh, when we were looking at uh, chapter 11, we saw a passage there where Jesus confronts the crowds for uh, their unbelief, who refused to repent. Last week, the end of chapter 11, we saw Jesus come down even harder on the Pharisees and the scribes for their hypocrisy. This week, beginning chapter 12, surprisingly, as Jesus' words have gotten sharper, the crowds keep getting bigger. I mean, so big that it's getting a little chaotic. People are stepping on each other. But, but now Jesus focuses on his own followers, on his disciples. The last part of verse 1 Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. The, the, the leaven of the Pharisees? Our, our, uh, in, even our English word uh, comes from the idea of, of rising. Think uh, like levitate. Um, so, uh, you might think this is about yeast, uh, you know, what causes bread to rise. Actually, it, it would be more uh, like sourdough we would be... Uh, consistent with what they were using at that time. So, a kind of fermentation in bread that, well, makes it rise. And in this case, the point is not about rising so much as it, as it is about permeating, something that works its, all, its way all the way through the, the bread, the dough. And the idea here is this hypocrisy, if, if, if hypocrisy starts to get into you, it will work its way all through you. We, we talked about hypocrisy last week. We didn't see actually that word, but it was there because Jesus said the, the Pharisees focused on the outward appearance and not the inward. They were so concerned with all the ways that would be a show of their uh, religiosity, of their importance and significance in society. And, they, and meanwhile, inside they were corrupt. They were rotten. That, that's hypocrisy. And, and Jesus is saying to his disciples, he's saying to us, those who have committed their lives to him, look out, don't let that kind of hypocrisy start to come into contact with you. It will work its way through you. Its corruption will work its way through your heart, your mind, your soul, and your, your mask may seem to work for a while. People might think, well, you're, you're a pretty decent person. You might even be a pretty good person. They may think you're holy, but that mask will not hide you forever. That's the warning of verses 2 and 3. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Now, uh, if you wrote that verse and gave it to your English teacher, you'd hear, now, let's, let's avoid the double negative. It's kind of hard to... There is nothing that will not be, wait a minute, does that mean everything will be revealed? Okay, yes, that's what it means, and that is possibly clearer, but don't jump too quickly away from the, the wording, even though it might be a little awkward, hard to follow, because I think it is telling us something very important, even in the way it's written. Here, here's why, because, because we think, we, we think that, well, they won't be able to hide they won't be able to hide. They won't be able to hide. But I will. He's saying, nothing. There is nothing that will not be one day revealed. There is nothing that you can... So you see that. He's not, there is nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. Therefore, you... Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. When you think, you think I'm, I'm going to say, I'm just going to whisper this, I'm going to say this in the cover of darkness, nobody will know. This will be our little secret about who I really am. And he's saying, you know, someday it's going to be, it's going to be splashed on billboards. It's going to be, it's going to be out there on the internet. And you know, it's, if it's on the internet, it's there forever and everybody's seeing it. You know, it's, it's going to be out there. You, you think you're whispering behind closed doors. You're, it's your secret, but it's going to be shouted from rooftops. It, don't let the, the, the lie of hypocrisy convince you that you can keep something hidden. That who you are, particularly if it's in, in the, the corruption of, of sin, that, that we'll be able to, well, well, we'll just keep that out of sight. 
it's, it's sad and it's foolish when Christians think that we can get away with things like that. Some of you are aware, I know, of the, the stories, multiple articles that were in the Houston Chronicle this past week regarding sexual abuse and cover-up in, the, in Southern Baptist churches. The, the, this is not saying at all about, uh, oh, well, yeah, they've got a problem. They, that's one of the lessons. We can't say, oh, well, it's just the Roman Catholic Church. That, they've got the problem, not us Protestants. Oh, boy, wait a minute. Now it's Southern Baptists, and, and it's, at least it's them and it's not us. Well, we have to, you have to give attention to your own household. You can't assume that, well, it's somebody else's problem, but, but specifically the issue of we think we can hide things. The, now, the, the abuse itself is, is unspeakably awful. It should break our hearts that it even happened. And we, we, we should be more vigilant on this. But the reason I'm bringing this up at this point, that the, the cover-up by Christian leaders is only, it should anger us further. We, we all understand the logic of cover-up, right? We, we don't want to deal with the consequences of our sin. But that is a lie that we, that we can get away with it. Sooner or later, we will have to answer for what we've done. And get this, later is not the Houston Chronicle. Sooner is the Houston Chronicle. Do do, do you follow? Sooner is when your sin finds you out amongst uh, other people, find out who you are. Later, that's sooner. Later is when you stand before God. And it's true. Sooner or later Everything that you thought you could hide is going to come out. Maybe in the papers. Definitely when you stand before God. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Hebrews 4.13. God sees God knows, and one day we will have to answer to Him. What what is the antidote to hypocrisy? What is its opposite? Many in our culture would say today, the opposite, the antidote to hypocrisy is authenticity. That's a kind of a a, a buzzword of, of our generation. Authenticity. But it can't, understand, it cannot be merely authenticity. Do you know what I mean by that? Because, yeah, absolutely, to be authentic, to be transparent is, is certainly better than the mask. There's something honest and truthful about that. But, but here's the thing. If you are authentically corrupt, if you are genuinely rotten on the inside, then being authentic about it, being transparent about it just means, well, you're, hey, I'm not, I'm not trying to hide anything. Here's who I am. That, okay, so that's better than lying about it, but it's still not good. The best antidote to hypocrisy is to deal with what's on the inside, with what you're trying to, trying to hide. So, the, I mean, we have these things that God gives us. We have confession, which is to say, I'm going to be open about this. I'm going to acknowledge and admit. I'm going to own up to what I've done. We, and not just confession, but repentance. With God's help, I will turn from, away from what I've done and who I've been. We, 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 with, with honesty, not hypocrisy, about the process of growth and transformation that, that it will take for God to do His work completely in us. That's Christian authenticity, or, or better, a godly integrity. That's the answer to hypocrisy. But let's, let's continue in our passage, and I want to read again verses 4 through 7. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that, have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, for you are of more value than many sparrows. that, That seems like uh, complete polar opposites in just a few verses, right? The, the, the tone and the, the, the weight of that. He, here's the point, and I put it, this in the outline. Fear God because God's wrath is worse 
and his love is better. This is, how we, we, this is what we need to know, be convinced of, to be ready for our moment of answering for our faith. Now, the problem with hypocrisy, as we said last week, is that it, it really it communicates that we care more about what other, other people think about us than about what God thinks about us. Because we, we know we can, we can put on a good show for other people, but if we're honest, we, we know that God knows anyway, and so really what we're trying to do, we, we can't fool him. So we really are saying, I, I care about more what, about what other people think than about what God thinks when we pursue that kind of hypocrisy. And usually it, it just simply means we just want people to like us. I just want people to, in, in this case, it's, it's caring more about people because we don't want them to kill us. Well, that seems reasonable, don't you think, to care about that, to care about what other people think because some of them want to kill you? And now, of course, when he talks about fearing those who can kill the body in verse 4, he's not talking about avoiding certain parts of Rockford or Chicago and certain times of the day. He, he's got something much more specific in mind. A follower of Jesus Christ may face people who would happily kill him or her. Maybe because, because they are religious zealots, terrorists in some kind of holy war, or atheistic governmental authorities tightening their grip. Jesus says, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. Yeah, so all, all they can do is kill you. Well, okay, that's kind that that's true, but death is kind of a big deal. But you understand that this life is not all there is for the Christian. You understand that death is not the end. You understand that we believe that there is a life beyond this life, a life of of peace and rest, of glory in God's presence within a restored creation where he reigns, and we do too. That's, that's what we say we believe. But, but think about this. Even that glorious eternal life with God is not automatic. At the end of your life, at the end of each, the life of each person, we will stand before God with that destiny hinging on this moment. We will stand before a higher court than any here on earth. And the question is whether you are ready or not to stand before God in that moment. Because beyond death, the one that sits at that judgment seat has the power to cast you into hell or welcome you into his kingdom. Those are the stakes that we have here. That's why you fear God more than anyone else. Or, to put it another way, a believer will choose to suffer rejection from anyone else if it knows that it means acceptance and welcome by their God. Now, that's big stuff. See, this is... This is what makes Christian faith powerful and undefeatable from powers and empires and authorities and people with guns and people with, with uh, torture chambers. If, 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 if a believer is willing, I'll, I'll suffer rejection from anyone else before I would ever think of suffering rejection from God. I want, if I'm accepted with him, I can accept rejection from anyone else. Uh, then and 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 here in this in these just these few verses, without in any way softening the harsh reality of God's judgment, the the stakes are this: if you walk into the before the judgment of God and He says uh, you are condemned, it means hell. And then Jesus on the dime turns and says, "But do you? I want you to understand not only the the harshness of the reality of God's judgment. I also want you to understand the warmth." Of his, of his love for those who belong to him, his covenant love. He says, you could, you could go to a market and, and buy five sparrows for just a couple of small coins. Now, you might ask, well, why would somebody, 
buy sparrows at the market. That kind of sounds like a silly thing to buy. But here's the, the thing. The, the sparrows were the, the most affordable meat, if you can believe this, of the poorest of the poor. For just a couple of cents, and you're thinking, well, that's not much meat. Well, you, you're getting the point. It, it's, a, it's a meager, poor, uh, impoverished meal, but that's, that's why somebody would buy sparrows. Most people, as you can th- you think about it, most people wouldn't even bother if you had any means at all. So he, but even though those sparrows have little to no monetary value, Jesus says God sees, God knows every sparrow. Some of you will, of course, many of you will remember the old song. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Jesus says, you are more valuable than many sparrows. And when Jesus here says that, you've got to know, all of, all of the hairs of your head are numbered. He obviously, of course, means by God, and it's not that God is just an amazing counter. Or, or even that we'll say, yes, God, this is, a, this is a declaration of God's omniscience. He is all-knowing. The point is not about God's omniscience, though He is, and it is true, and it is mind-blowing. The point is that He has infinite and intimate knowledge of you. Some, some of you, I'm sure, had mothers. Maybe there is a mother sitting here right now who's, who has looked at your child and said, I can count every freckle on your face. And that is a, such a tender moment of in, uh, endearing moment to, to say, I, I love you. I'm just, I, I, I know every, I know you because I know every freckle on your face. God says, that's what it means when it, we hear that God has every hair on your head counted. He knows you intimately and he will, it says elsewhere that he, he won't even let a hair of your head fall to the ground. Just like he knows the sparrows when they fall, he knows the hairs of your head when they fall. He's, he's concerned with you. He knows you. He loves you. So think of that. I mean, we've got, can you hold this together? If you're having trouble, it's because God is that big, right? The, this is the God who is the, the judge who can, can and will send someone to hell for their sin if they if they have not received his forgiveness and mercy, is the one who, if he has set his love on you, if you have reached out to him for his grace and he has put his love on you, he knows you. He cares for you. He's watching you. He, he's, can, he, can he keep track of all of my stuff, my business? He's watching sparrows. He's, got, he's keeping track of all the, the ones that you don't even, you're not even aware of. We were driving yesterday and, and saw, a, a, what, 18 deer in one field? And I heard somebody else, uh, the Imbles, at th- th- their house, they had uh, dozens outside of their house. I mean, you're like, wow, it, there they are. Well, God knew, th- you weren't thinking about them until you saw them. God knew every one. He's watching over his creation. If he can keep track of all that, yes, yes, he is keeping track of you. He knows you. He cares for you. This is, this is not just the power and the knowledge of our God. This is his care and love for his people. When you know that the wrath of God is worse than anything you could face from man, when you know that the love of God is better for you than the love, the acceptance, the approval, the affirmation of any human being, then you can face anything. You can face anything. This is a story, a true story. I've shared it in print a number of years ago, but, but not in a sermon. It's from a little book uh, called Tortured for Christ by Richard Wormbrand. He was a, a Christian who suffered under communism in Romania after World War II. Here's just a, a little excerpt. It was, this is when he was in prison. He said it was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners as it is in captive nations today. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching, so we accepted their terms. It was a deal. We preached, and they beat us. We were happy preaching, and they were happy beating us. So everyone was happy. 
He says, I've seen beautiful things. Sometimes the preachers were laymen, simple men inspired by the Holy Spirit who often preached beautifully. All of their heart was in their words, for to preach under such punitive circumstances was no trifling matter. Then the guards would come and take the prisoner out and beat him half to death. If a poor man is a lover of is a great lover of music. He gives his last dollar to listen to a concert. He is then without money, but he does not feel frustrated. He has heard beautiful things. I don't feel frustrated to have lost many years in prison. I have seen beautiful things. I myself have been among the weak and insignificant ones in prison, but I have had the privilege to be in the same jail with great saints, heroes of the faith who equaled the Christians of the first centuries. They went gladly to die for Christ. The spiritual beauty of such saints and heroes of faith can never be described. Because they feared the wrath of God more and they loved the love of God more, they they didn't fear anybody else. Fear, Fear him and fear not. That's when we're ready to answer for our faith. That's when Christianity is unstoppable. Verses 8 and 9. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me, Jesus, before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Point three, confess Christ. Because distancing yourself from the Savior will not save you in the end. Once again, Jesus links our having to answer for our faith before men on earth now, or we could say in this age, with having to answer before God in heaven at the end. Both are a kind of judgment that may result in condemnation, that may result in suffering. And that suffering, of course, is why it's tempting to deny Christ. If, they, if all they can do is kill you, well, they can kill me. And, and that's why it's tempting to, to deny Jesus. The authorities have hauled you in, and, and it's your own testimony that will determine what comes next for you. If you say, no, no, I, I'm no, I'm not a Christian. Jesus doesn't mean anything to me. Then, then, well, then they'll let you go. They, they won't confiscate your property. They won't, they won't take your kids from you. Last year, uh, I read the novel Silence. Uh, you may have seen the movie a couple years ago. It was about uh, Portuguese Catholic missionaries in Japan in the 1600s. Now, this is not an endorsement of, of Catholic theology or doctrine, or so, but it is a, uh, an interesting exploration of persecution. The, the Japanese officials torment these imprisoned priests, offering them freedom if they will just step on a picture of Jesus. And, and they're saying to them, just, it's, just, it's just a small thing. You, you, can, you can do this. You, you, the, all the pain and the suffering you're feeling, you can have your freedom. It's, it's, it's a small thing. It's just, just step, just step lightly on the picture. It's, it, it's not going to hurt him. He's, he, he doesn't, he doesn't want to th- see you suffer. D- wouldn't he want you to do this so that you could have your suffering relieved? And, of course, I'm sitting in the, on the comfort of my couch uh, answering uh, these officials saying, well, If it's such a small thing for them to step on the picture of Jesus and to end their suffering, why are you making such a big deal about it? Why why is everything, why is their their freedom and their their torture and their their lives hinge on whether or not they step on the picture of Jesus? Yeah, yes, yes, at one level, it's just a picture. You're not hurting Jesus by stepping on a picture. Uh, That's absolutely true, but yet... It's a big deal to you. You, you apparently think that if, if, if I step on this picture, that that means something, that you've won, that you, that you have caused 
that believer to betray his Savior, his Master. Whether you are for or against Jesus, with or without him, that, that's everything for a Christian. That's what we believe, and that's what Jesus has taught us. The, it's, the, the, the danger is that if we say about Jesus to others, uh, I, ne- I never knew him, that there will be the day when Jesus stands before the Father and says of us, I never knew him. That, that's what Jesus says here in verses 8 and 9. If we acknowledge him, if we confess him, as I said in the outline, we, we, we say, if we say, he's with me. We talk about confessing sin, like admitting it, but, but to confess sin in the, the literal meaning of the word is to own it. Like, yep, I, th- that thing that I'm accused of, yes, that's me. I did it. Confessing sin. Confessing Christ, and that word is here in the Greek. To, to confess Christ is to say, Jesus, yeah, yes, that's me. I'm with him. To acknowledge him before men. You can count on the fact that he will acknowledge you as his before the Father. Now, here. You understand, and here's, just think about, about it, putting, uh, putting it this way, as I try to put it in the outline, we, we think, well, wait a minute, my salvation is not based on uh, whether I, I uh, stand up, stand up for Jesus. It's, it's, isn't it because I trusted him that he died for my sins on the cross, and isn't that how I get to heaven? Well, yes, absolutely. But you understand, if you are, if, if he's the Savior, and you're standing, you're saying, well, I'm not over there with him, I'm over here, I, I, I don't want to be, like, well, you're distancing yourself from the Savior. You're abandoning the Savior. And if the only way you're saved is with Him, is to be in Him, to belong to Him, to say, I need you, I'm holding on to you. And what that looks like in the moment of trial is to say, I'm, I don't know where this is going, but I'm holding on to Jesus. Those moments when we are tempted to deny him are not only in courtrooms. They are in break rooms and locker rooms. Distancing yourself from your Savior will not save you. If, if I just stand a little bit away, then I won't come under the wrath of people. But if you are not with him, he will come under the wrath of God. If you are with him, you might take some flack. But if you are with him, you are welcomed into the very presence of a holy God and to his joy and life forever. You may ask, and appropriately, well, wait a minute, but what about Peter? What about, we, we, we know that Peter denies Jesus. He denied him three times, right? I mean, and he's, he, he didn't go to hell, right? Wasn't he restored? Didn't Jesus restore him at the end of the Gospel of John? This, this doesn't say that you can't be restored after denying Jesus. You can, just like Peter was. But don't think that you can deny him once and for all, or deny him, and, and that's your fixed position, and think that you will be counted with him in eternity. Now, that, that concern for restoration uh, is spoken to in the very next verse, which is a very hard verse. Verse 10, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Oh, and I, you just like, oh, did you have to put that verse in there? This is, good. This is really complicated. If, if our salvation comes through faith in Christ, it, how come it seems to make blaspheming the Spirit the greater sin, the bigger problem? And why is it unforgivable? It doesn't exactly say that. It's not the unforgivable sin or the unpardonable sin. It is a sin that will not be forgiven. 
uh, that's maybe a little subtle, but I think the, the first thing to do in trying to help understand this, even this one verse, is to note that in, in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, where this same, uh, these same lines happen, it's connected much more tightly to the story that we saw in Luke chapter 11, a couple of Sundays ago, when uh, Jesus uh, cast out a demon, and he claims to do so by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, see Matthew 12, 28. He claims to cast out the demon by the power of the Holy Spirit. The people around him say, oh, he did that by the power of the devil. Do you see how that's a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? You're taking something that Jesus did in, by the very power of God, by the, by the finger of God, Luke says, by the Holy Spirit, Matthew says, and, and you're, saying, you're taking that and saying, that's the devil. Okay, that's, that's the, this blasphemy. So, it, it, it's a lot of people are the, the unpardonable sin. Have, did, what if I do it? What if I do it on accident? What if I like? No, it, it's not going to happen for one thing. And if you're really concerned about it, it's probably the best sign that you haven't done it. If you are that hardened, that uh, gone in your sin, you're you're not going to care about it. If you're concerned, don't don't worry that this is something you've accidentally done. But let's, let's get, I mean, get back to the text, and I want to end this with the positive side that concludes this section, verses 11 and 12. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. The last thing you need to know to be ready Beware of hypocrisy, fear God, confess Christ, rely on the Holy Spirit because the breath of God will provide your defense when you need it. These verses reflect the fact that the first opposition to followers of Jesus came from, well, their fellow Jews, sadly. As they said, they'll bring you into the synagogues, but it would soon come from the Roman Empire itself, which is exactly how the story of Jesus played out. And even though Rome would eventually adopt, adopt Christianity 300 years later or so, there have been no shortage down through history of powers and authorities and empires who would oppose Christ and his followers. Just even in our own, uh, in the last year or two, uh, the country of Nepal outlawed any kind of evangelism. Uh, you're hearing stories in China of them cracking down on churches and imprisoning pastors. We, we, we hear stories of Christians in those settings, and, and do, you, do you wonder like I do? Like, how, how would I really do? How, how would I really react, respond if I was in those situations? Would I be able to stand up for Christ under persecution? Would I, would I crack? Would I cave? This is the encouragement, the, the final encouragement that we have. Not only the, the, the love and care of the, the Father who knows us intimately, not only the, the, the Jesus who will stand by us as we have stood by Him, but the Holy Spirit in us and with us. We, you don't have to plan a big speech for your moment. You don't have to come up with better arguments or an airtight defense for yourself. The Spirit will give us the words we need. He is the perfect one for the job. Do you, do you understand this? Because uh, what we believe, what the Bible teaches us about the Spirit and the Word, the Word, God's, is the Scriptures, uh, you know, the, 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 the God's, uh, the, the Word is God-breathed. Some of you know the, the word Spirit and, and wind and breath, all the same word we sang it earlier the Spirit is the, the breath of God. And, and think of the, the Word comes as God Himself speaks. It, as He speaks, it is, it's His breath coming to us. It is, it is His utterance. And, and if, if the breath of God can give us the Word of God, certainly He can give us the words we need for the moment of truth, the moment of testing, the moment where our faith must be answered for. Do you think He can give you the words you need? Then you don't have to worry about living up 
to that moment. We, we do have some great examples in history of people who amazingly lived up to their moment. Uh, I, and it seems that they were given words, not just for their defense, but last words that have lasted throughout time. I, I know the, the um, high school Sunday school class Logan's leading is going through some church history, and one of the stories that they have looked at recently is uh, um, one of the earliest, m- the earliest martyr story we have outside the Bible. So in the Bible, Stephen, James, killed for their faith. Outside the Bible, uh, the first story, Polycarp, kind of a funny name, but he was a guy who lived, uh, born in uh, 69 or so, the year 69 AD, and he was, as a very young man, knew Jesus' disciple John, the Apostle John, as an old man and was taught by him. In the, in the mid-2nd century, so we're talking about 155, 56, some have it dated later, he was put to death for his faith in the arena. I mean, the classic picture, right? You're in the, the, in the uh, Roman-style arena, not necessarily the Roman Colosseum, but an arena like that. Here's, here's a little bit of his story. This is coming from very early uh, texts. When the crowd heard that Polycarp had been captured, there was an uproar. The proconsul asked him whether he was Polycarp. On hearing that he was, he tried to persuade him to apostatize, meaning to reject Christ, saying, have respect for your old age, swear by the fortune of Caesar, repent and say, down with the atheists, meaning down with the Christians. They called them atheists because they didn't believe in all the Roman gods, so they pejoratively, they critically called the Christians atheists. They didn't believe in the gods, right? So just say, down with the atheists. Polycarp looked grimly at the wicked heathen multitude in the stadium and gesturing towards them, he said, down with the atheists. Perturbed, the proconsul says, swear, urged the proconsul, reproach Christ and I will set you free. Eighty-six years have I served him, Polycarp declared, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? I have wild animals here, the proconsul said. I will throw you to them if you do not repent. Call them, Polycarp replied. It is unthinkable for me to repent from what is good to turn to what is evil. I will be glad, though, to be changed from evil to righteousness. If you despise the animals, I will have you burned. You threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and then is extinguished. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. Bring it on. Now, if you just think of Polycarp as a hero, as like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, you, might, you might despair of your, the, the possibility of your own living up to, well, to your moment, whenever that is, whether that's in the break room or whether that's in some court or in front of some firing squad. I, I don't know. But here, you, you have to remember what Jesus has taught us. Sooner or later, yes, it will come when you will have to answer for your faith. And the question is, will you be ready to stand when it really counts? He's told us what we need to know. You've got to beware of hypocrisy. Beware of just like, okay, I, I can hide. I can hide and no one will see. I can hide my sin. I can hide my faith. Don't do it. I, 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 fear, fear God. His, his wrath is worse and his love is better. Confess Christ. You can't save yourself by distancing yourself from the Savior Hold fast to him and you will be saved no matter if they kill you or not. And and trust the Holy Spirit. He'll give you what to say. It may not be written down and and told in stories uh, thousands of years later. But But if it's the words that you have for that moment to say something like, I've 
Jesus has been good to me for all these years. I, I'm not going not gonna to walk away from him now. Then, then we can rest assured that he will indeed say when we, in a moment, stand before that judgment seat sooner than we thought, that he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. The, the condemnation that we experienced here will be glorious. Welcome there. Is that, is that fables, pie in the sky? It, it, or is it the truth of God and the promises of Jesus Christ? That's something you'll have to decide. But the question is, you need to, and the encouragement here today is, you have this now. I don't know when your moment of truth will be. Maybe it will be sometime this week in some small way. Maybe there is one that we will all face someday down the road, but we know sooner or later it will happen one way or the other and ultimately before God himself. And I pray that you will be ready with what Jesus has given us to make us ready. Let's pray. Father, first I want to thank you for, for being good enough to live for and good enough to die for. I thank you that Jesus walked that path before any of us would ever have to. And Lord, I, I pray this is, this is hard stuff. And yet it's, it's, it's real stuff. It's stuff that we have to deal with and, and stuff we have to be prepared for. Thank you for helping us prepare for our moment. And we do lift up to you our brothers and sisters around the world that have faced their moment again and again, are facing their moment even in this time and God, for the, we pray for the grace and the strength and your presence to be with them. We pray that in our moment we would honor them and even more to honor you. God, we're, you know how weak we are. And so we're, we really are depending on your spirit, on your presence with us, your loving care and all your promises for now and for eternity. Strengthen us, we pray, and give us the joy, a vision of the joy set before us to endure all things in Jesus' name. Amen.